My name is Irene Anena, and I work with the Church of Uganda as a program officer for gender and social justice. It is an honor today to introduce our next speaker, Honorable Grace Kwechwin. Honorable Grace Kwechwin is a minister for Northern Uganda, a position she has held since 2016. From 2011, she served for 10 years as a member of parliament for Zomba district in West Nile. Honorable Grace has served on the Navy Diocese Finance and Planning Committee and currently chairs the Construction Committee for St. Stephen's Cathedral in Navy Diocese. She has a master's degree in business administration, a postgraduate diploma in management, and a bachelor's of arts in social sciences, all from Makerere University. Honorable Grace is a mother of two. She's passionate about rural community development and spent many years working for SNV, the Netherlands Development Organization, before joining Uganda's parliament. She continues to offer herself as a rural development consultant in a home district of Zombo. Honorable Grace is a founder of the Zombo United Circle and a founder of the Zombo district branch of Uganda Women's Effort to Save Orphans, Oweso. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Honorable Grace Kwechwin to the second Archbishop Leadership Summit on the topic of implications for how the Church of Uganda organizes itself internally to position parishes as centers for economic transformation. Thank you. According to the recent census conducted in 2014, 82% of the population of Uganda are Christians. And out of these, 32% are Anglican. At least this shows the great work the church is doing in spreading the gospel of Christianity. But also, as we know, the basic function of the church is to involve the Christian in every facet of their lives holding true to the mission that Christ led. Christ looked at the needs of the people, provided it, and then began to preach out of the good deeds. Rick Warren suggests that the church functions are worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and mission. And this is also backed up in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. But I wanted to go back to the origin, the historic perspective of the Protestant work ethics. The Protestant work ethics concept in theology sociology, economics, and history asserts that hard work and discipline and frugality are a result of a person's subscription to the value exposed by the Protestant faith. I have actually also come across this where people say Protestants are very hardworking. Protestants are very committed. But let's see how it goes. In the olden days, in the 16th century, the work of the Protestants contributed to the banking in Europe. And in the 18th century, the Protestant merchants' families began to move into banking, into trading, into business in Europe. And at the same time, new types of financial services broadened, and the banking went far and beyond Europe. 
Also, the Protestant concept of God and man allows believers to use all their God-given faculties, including the power of reason. That means that they are allowed to explore God's creation, and according to Genesis 2, verse 15, make use of it in a responsible and sustainable way. God has put us and commanded us to be dominions over his creation. The cultural climate was created that great enhanced the development of humanities and the sciences. Industry, frugality, calling, dis discipline, and strong sense of responsibility are the heart of the Protestant moral code. And in those days, as a result, productivity increased and this led to increased profits and it enabled our Christians to employ and even pay higher wages. The role of the church in promoting social development in Uganda, and I want to bring this also from a study, a comparative study, which was done in Kabale municipality, which established what we fairly also know, that it is a fact that many schools, primary and secondary, many health facilities have been founded by the church. Of course, some are government, and government is also partnering with the church, and some are also private individuals. The study found that religious institutions touch the misery exhibited by the poor and needy and responded by giving direct aid and provision of social services. The study presented ethical principles that should guide development, and these included the common good, the preferential option for the poor, the beneficence, stewardship, distributive uh, justice, and sanctity of life. These values are cherished by the common people. And actually, if you go to um, a religious-based or Protestant facility, you'd find the values there. You feel different. You feel serene. You feel uh, um, appreciated. You feel loved. You feel it's different from other facilities. And for me, this is a great investment that the church needs to take forward. The study recommended two things. One, provide chaplains in schools, especially, because we have to nurture, we have to make our youth grow in faith. And the second one is to, for the church to encourage local contribution, involve the local people in planning for their needs. I think this is very, very important because as we uh, take on the mission, as we spread the word of God, what about the need? And I had referred it uh, early, to it earlier on, even when in the time of Jesus, Jesus took care of the needs of the people. The prevailing situation, therefore, is that the church and its Christians can contribute a lot to human progress. From the old and even now, there is a lot of activities which can support this in Uganda, the church has established key educational facilities, schools. On the weekend, I was in Lango Diocese, where the church was saying, how can we bring back the glory of the schools, the Dr. Bote College, the Mvara Secondary School, the King's College Budo? How can we bring the glory of those days so that we can support the needs in education of our children? Same with the hospitals. There are also other programs, for example, the Compassion Program, which is emphasizing on supporting the needy and bringing them out of poverty. The needy children um, are educated so that they can get employed, so that they can stand on their own. Then we also have the Kingdom Development Organization, KIDO, which is simulating mobilization of resources in the communities to support education and also to support health of the Christians. The church also has property, land, 
the church also has the church house, for example, here in Kampala, guest houses in the diocese, um, projects in agriculture, poultry, dairy, and so on. But I need to say here is that uh, we need to do more than we are doing. We are not doing enough yet. And I want to pre appreciate the church that in 1974, the Church of Uganda established an advisory office of the Provincial Department of Planning, Development and Rehabilitation in Social Economic Development to the Archbishop then. And the main aim, the strategic objective here was to transform Church of Uganda into a facilitator, the, 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 the planning, development and rehabilitation, into a facilitator of socioeconomic development interventions in the church to help God's people get socioeconomic empowerment and dignified livelihood. So when the church is doing all this, what are our problems? The European Christians were great leaders and businessmen and political leaders, but in our today church, much as we have great political leaders and business people among us, down at the parishes, we have big challenges. The worship, the fellowship, the discipleship is going on, but our people have not risen up to challenge the socioeconomic environment. And this we can see in some of these I'm going to list. One, development planning for socioeconomic programs to support the livelihood of the Christians is weak and sometimes inadequate, sometimes even lacking, especially at the parish levels. Some dioceses, archdeaconaries, and parishes do not even have income generating activities to support them and its people. And yet they need, the socioeconomic need of our Christians are enormous. The very first time I became a member of the finance committee of maybe diocese, when Archbishop Orombe was an archdeacon, I got embarrassed to the fact that the archdeacon in the person of Bishop Orombe was earning 7,000 shillings as salary. And I was an assistant district administrator earning, I think, 18,000 uh, shillings that time. But I looked at the church. If the archdeacon was earning 6,000, what about the reverend, the parish uh, reverend, the catechist? How much would they earn? So this is a challenge that we need to support our church financially in order to meet its objectives. The second challenge, the second problem I've seen is that the church has engaged more in charity than socioeconomic empowerment programs. Yes, our people are poor. Our people need compassion. Our people need support. But we needed to generate the resources in order to help them. Otherwise, the mindset of being poor and must always receive materials from other people, I think is being challenged here because even European partners who have been helping the church, most of them have changed their approach. They don't no longer support, but this is an area to address. Many church projects are struggling because we cannot contribute enough. Many have uh, stalled. I am the chairperson of the Cathedral Construction of Nebi Diocese, and I know how long it is taking us to put up the church. The high number of the youth in the church are not adequately engaged, especially in contributing to resource mobilization or participating in income generation activities. So I have attempted to come up with some recommendations how the church can organize itself better and I must say that these are not really new but the church can build on what it is already doing. The church needs to organize itself better in leadership and strategy in order to be more effective 
in addressing the spiritual and physical needs of the Christians. In the leadership, the human and material resources need to, know, to, to be mobilized, like I have already indicated in our challenges. We need to mobilize our people, we need to mobilize resources to support the church. The notion of economic empowerment of the Christians to produce more and be able to create wealth needs to be nurtured in the church. When the Christians have, they will be able to support the church, they will be able to support their families, they will be able to give to the needy. This requires leadership and management practices that can, that can mobilize the resources, like I have said, that can relate to central government, to local government, to development organizations, so that they can understand their policies, they can access resources that is being provided. It also needs leadership which is well informed in order to steer and make critical decisions at the right time for socioeconomic development as well as spiritual development. So what must we do here? The church must regularly coach and train its leadership. Exchange visits, refresher courses are very important because we learn from one another. Number two, when I look at project development, strategic project identification, planning and implementation, under the planning, development and rehabilitation of the church need to be evaluated. Since 1974 to now, how are we performing? Have we registered any successes? We uphold that. Have we registered any failures? We need to address it. The structure for supporting planning and development for socioeconomic empowerment must be rooted in the community. We know it is very strong at the province level, but it weakens as it goes to the diocese, to the archdeaconry, and to the, to the parishes. The youth specifically need to be mobilized to take up easy but profitable projects like poultry, like bakery, like um, uh, vegetable growing, something which can uh, bring them quick money so that they can be empowered uh, socioeconomically. The church can have bigger projects. I have seen in some dioceses the mothers' unions coming up with uh, with, uh, with restaurants, with uh, hostels, with diary projects. But like I said before, that is not enough. So what must the church do? The church must establish critical offices with well-trained project coordinators at the diocese, at the archdeaconry, at the parish level, to mobilize, to plan, and implement these projects in order to build the livelihood of the Christians. The project Coordinators must create linkage to the central, to the local governments, so as to access and benefit from development programs. And I can give a good example here. The government is discussing parish development model, meaning that resources are going to be given to the parish, administrative parish. Money is going to be given there. The Christians there should participate in the planning of the resources and projects so that they can also benefit. Because at the parish level, it will be money, it will be extension work, it will be mobilization of resources, it will be training. This can empower our Christians so that when they go to church, they can add value to the activities of the church. Maintenance of social services. I started by indicating that the church has good schools and health facilities, but there must be deliberate planning for maintenance and sustenance for quality and service. It is absurd sometimes when we go to our facilities, we don't get the, 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 quality, the, the quality service, but this is an area which can be promoted. The values of common good, the preferential option for the poor, the, 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 the stewardship, the love, the sanctity which we show to the people who are clients who come for services. 
is very, very important, is unique, and the church can promote that. Once people are attracted to the quality of service and the godly values in these services, they'll, they'll develop a sense of belonging and ownership to these projects and support them. So the church must organize effective management boards that can provide a foresight and develop strategies for maintenance and growth and enforce and implement them. The next point here is accessibility to financial services. This is a very important uh, facility in the local areas, but also at the higher level. As you have already said, there is a big need to mobilize financial services to promote the church development. The church requires a lot of financial and material resources to support and implement its program. Whether it is missionary or pastoral work, whether it is salaries to its uh, employees, whether it is projects, whether it's construction of church houses. The church should establish savings and credit cooperatives and at parish levels to provide accessibility to finances for income generation and also economic activities of its members. The church should also establish development funds to support its infrastructural programs. My next point is about relationship with business, political and civic leaders. Like we observed earlier on, many Christians are too busy minding their businesses to make ends meet, but occasionally, of course, go to the churches. These Christians are blessed with resources and ideas, and we should exploit these resources. The church leaders should deliberately build a relationship of trust and tap from these political, civic leaders and business communities in order to mobilize resources. My next point is about discipleship and mission. The church mission and discipleship is challenged by the current demands and lavish and quick lifestyle of especially of, of our youth. The church should recruit the youth in the church leadership, recruit and train them, and strengthen the existing chaplains, for example, in secondary schools, in organizations, and also put uh, youth leadership in the communities so that we can nurture our faith and our mission. So in conclusion, the church has a responsibility to provide a holistic support to its Christians. The church must always organize itself and remain relevant to the changing environment. And I like that even now in the COVID situation, the church has organized itself and I'm sure many people are now having meetings through Zoom, and the youth especially will be able and happy to participate in the Zoom programs. The environment is continuously changing, and the church must also continuously change, but must not forget its focus. Its focus is mission, its fellowship, its growing faith, but also not forgetting the physical needs of its members. I want to thank you for listening to me.